destiny to green pastures, a realignment of self to eternity. Where are we on this journey of realizing our green pastures? How is our realignment process going? Here at Green Pastures, we focus on the realignment of our flesh because our spiritual part doesn't need to be realigned, doesn't it? Our spiritual part of our bodies are housed in our soul department. And so we know that the soul is immortal, perfect, eternal, incorruptible. So the only part of us that we have to worry about is the flesh. And as chaplains, we are primarily pastoral care providers. Just for reflection, Psalms 23, what better author to write a psalm on God's pastoral provisions than that of King David. And like King David, who personally knew God and God's provision, our goal and our desire today is to say the same. Father, God, we want to personally know you as our pastoral care provider. As we navigate on this journey this one life that we have that we must live vicariously on as we navigate through this life, Lord God, we want you to lead the way because you are our shepherd. Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me besides the still waters. He restored my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Amen. Now let's fast forward to the century of the year of our Lord when Jesus, the Messiah of the seven continents, made his appearance on earth. And we teach here at Destiny to Green Pastures how Jesus came to remind the mind about the struggle between the flesh and the soul. So we will remind you often that there isn't anything in the soul that we can do about the soul. The soul is perfectly intact because it is immaculate, perfect, eternal, ancient, and incorruptible. So the only parts that we can make contributions and change or work on is the flesh. All the battle of this journey and this life that we are on are being worked out in the mind. And so Jesus comes to remind our flesh of what the soul houses, what the soul already knows. The soul knows that we are according to how God preordained us. The soul dwells inside of us. It's invisible. We cannot see it. The soul houses our Holy Spirit. And this Holy Spirit is perfect. This is the Holy Spirit that Jesus often referenced when Jesus shared with us about his father relationship and how he was reminding us that we too can get to this place where we live on earth knowing that we are eternal in our spiritual dwelling place where we came from. So we are living on earth. We're activating on earth. However, this life that we're living on earth should be according to how we are preordained or how we were preordained by God in the very beginning. So we want to live our life on earth knowing that this is the only stop we have to do it in the physical flesh. But our spiritual being, which cannot die, immortal and incorruptible, will continue on to testify once the flesh has shed itself or expired, we call it death. The process of restoration here is talking about reminding the flesh how it is according to the spirit, 
reminding ourselves of what God has already done for us in the spiritual realm, how God preordained us in this world to have dominion. We speak about it often in the terms that we use are called preordained heritage portfolio. We talk about us getting to our preordained heritage destiny. And so this conversation today is just to remind us that we are champions because God sees us as champions. And now we have to realign our present behavior back to how God created us. And once we are realigned, then we are going to be doing the things that God preordained us to do. If I can make an example, I would like to reference the Gospel of John chapter 1 from the King James Version. And I would like to read four verses, but I want to focus on the fourth. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. That's the fourth verse. The light of men. Let me read the fifth verse for you. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. I read this for you because I often like to explain the Holy Spirit inside of us, stored up inside of us like the size of a mustard seed. It is that spark within us waiting for us to become realized that it's within us so that we can voila, let it explore. Because you know, God, who will not violate his promises of free will, has given us this life whereby because God has proactive and has done everything for us in the beginning, God is not going to come back now and take his word and redo what he has said. Because he proacted, he gave us everything, that free will that we love so much. Now, God who resides in us, I like to refer and reference God as a mustard seed, as the light that is living within our gigantic bodies. <laughs> this, this tiny little seed living within us. And we don't even know that God is, is in us. Some of us don't know. And now the pastoral care provision that we provide we like to say that we help to increase that awareness. We want to make that the enhancement in your life. We want you to know that within you is this God, this immaculate, immortal, incorruptible God being living in us. And we don't even know because it's as if God is living in the darkness. Now, I know the scripture of Jesus was talking about the living of Jesus in the world and the world comprehended not that this is the light and that, the, that Jesus is the light for man. And the man that we're talking about now, I want to reference it in modern day's terms. We're talking about humanity, all of God's children, all human beings, not are segmentizing or dividing, regardless of who you are, as long as you're a human being, you are this man, amen, that Jesus wants to explain the relationship that exists between God our Father and us man. So Jesus came to remind us about all these dynamics, amen, because he had such a divine relationship with his father, and now he is reminding us how it is. Hallelujah. If I can reference the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verses 26 through 28, when 
we're going to be reminded, again, by the author of that scripture, that shows us that, okay, God is saying that I made you in my image. Let us make man in our image. This whole idea about human being being so powerful because we're so physical, we really need to take a step back and understand that we're dealing with ancient of ancient. And this world is not going to end today because we are living in it. Let's prepare for a world that is going to live another million years until God says so. I know we have climate change issues. I'm aware of that. But no one can destroy this world completely. There will always be one person that God will leave to be able to bring it back together again. We saw the narrative story when we talk about Noah and the ark. We saw that narrative. And when we talk today about climate change, I don't want to stray away from the subject too much, Lord, but I hear the Holy Spirit saying, just make some current references here. When we think about climate change today and we think about how atomic bombs exist, we think about how submarines exist, we know the ocean is there. And when, when one person has the power to press a button, and then he or she presses that button and the button erupts underwater all the way in the deep seas. And no one sees the things that we do in the darkness. And then when that water overpowers up and becomes a tsunami and people die, God gets the blame. But it's what we do in secret and in darkness that cause this volcanic behavior amongst humanity. And we always go back to blaming God. But here is this that I want to focus on. So God who has given us the ability to live in his image, who have created us in his image, we have to be the one to be reminded of it. Some of us have totally forgotten. We have moved so far away from God because of what? Our environment. The environment that we live in has caused us the trauma cause us to have transference, cause us to have pain. Some of us have had issues of abandonment, like myself, right? You know, that was my uh, P at one time. I once suffered from trauma of abandonment upon my mother's death. Amen. I thought, well, why is it that my mother should have left me? Why did she even born me? My life became so miserable at a, per a certain part of my life that I questioned why did you even make me? And I was angry with God for so many years. Amen. Because I believe that my mom abandoned me. Now I was a child. But remember, that's what I believe. And if she died, it doesn't matter. That's what you believe as a child. So children need to get counseling. Whenever a child loses a parent, we need to understand that if we do not address it, you will become like possible like me. And so God has this plan for our lives that no matter where we are and no matter who we are, God will always send someone. And so imagine how God sent Jesus at the time when God sent Jesus to impart to that community, the Hebrew community, about the relationship that exists between a man and his son the begotten son of God. You and I today are the same begotten children of God. Jesus wants us to know this. God intentionally is always thinking about us. He will always send someone to remind us. Ever since Jesus the Christ, the Messiah of all humanity came. Ah, oh, it's like a breath of fresh air. It's like God can finally relax and cruise because God knows that it is finished. The work that Jesus, the Messiah, was given to do, he gets a big check. He gets to wear his crown. He gets to remain the Christ. The question is this. Do we know what title God gave us before we were born? Do we know the titles that we were preordained with? 
they are hidden within our assignment. And the same way how our assignment, which God gave us in the beginning of time, some of us don't even know what it is because it is hidden still. The same way how that is hidden, then your identity, your, your crown, your title is hidden. And so the, the purpose of destiny to green pastures is not only to live vicariously, prosperously in this world, to live abundantly like Jesus often reminded us. He said, you know, you know who came, comes to steal, rob and destroy? A thief, he says. He said, but I come to give life abundantly. That's the Gospel of John 10.10. 10. Do we realize that we only have one life to live? And we need to ask ourselves, how are we living our lives? Are we living it the way God preordained it to be? Thine kingdom come, thine will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Are we living our lives the way God preordained it to be for us with all the promises and all the blessings? I can't even get into that today. We teach that at another another section. Amen. You can listen to those other messages about what's inside of our preordained heritage portfolio. The way God wants us to live and to prosper. Beloved, prosper. Above all things, I wish that thou will prosper as your soul prospereth. Constant reminders of how God is so intentional for us to get this life assignment and then finish your course, the course of life, finish it so that at the end of life's journey, we will be able to say like what Jesus has said, it is well done. We will be empty at the end because we would have taken everything that God preordained us with and would have completed our assignment. We would be empty, empty vessels going back home. Our flesh, of course, will go into the earth, but our spiritual achievement, amen, will reign and say, yes, God, you sent me to this world. I've conquered. I've had dominion. I was happy. I enjoyed it. But this is not my home. I'm coming back home. And we would have had done everything that we were supposed to do. One life, one chance to get it done. Where are we in our destiny? Now, I do know that when our lives have been severely damaged by things like abuse, rejection, loss, abandonment, which is mine, like I said before, or any type of long-term illnesses, the journey back to the realignment of self to our eternal self can be difficult. And this is why these teachings are here to show us that we need, need is the word. You know, we often use the word need erroneously for many things because the only thing that we need is God. Everything else is on a desire basis. When it comes to our body needing food and water and the basics, when we take the basics out of the way, the only need that we have in terms of relationships, the need is God. We desire a partner. We desire to have children. These are gifts factors. But the, the need, the need is God. And so when we think about how we have been broken because of our environment, whether or not we were the abuser or we became the victims. The bottom line is that something happened to cause the transference. Something caused us to behave the way we are behaving. We call it society taking responsibility for its citizen. We as a country, this country takes responsibility for all its citizens. Everything from child preservation before you are born to children being preserved after they are born. 
This country labors with its citizens. That's what God does. God labors with his children relentlessly. Have we noticed that God doesn't have anxiety? Have we noticed that God is not double-minded? Have we really noticed, <laughs> amen, that God does not react? Why? Because God is the proactive God. All that God intended for us was done in the beginning, you know, like systems within systems. I mean, we're systemic. We all have a beginning and an end. If humanity can have any complaint about God, many of the complaints would line up in this one area. Humanity wants to know, why aren't we flesh eternal? Why are we only spiritual eternal? Why couldn't this flesh continue to live? <laughs> Is what humanity wants to know. And they could be angry about that. I mean, I'm not saying they are. I'm saying if, if that will be the only place humanity would have a leg to stand on. Asking God, why didn't you make us eternal beings? But you know, God, God created us. So if you create something, right, it has a beginning and an end. So that was intentional on God's part. That was not a double-minded factor that, oh, by the way, you all are wicked, so I'm going to condemn you. That is not the Father at all. So let's go back to the model of Jesus, the Messiah of the seven continent. Jesus reminded us that he came to give us abundant life. Then the relationship that Jesus taught us about was that of his father and himself, that they were one as we are one. And so Jesus wanted us to remember whose we are. Therefore, we can know who we are. So we are from God and of God. Therefore, who we are are children of the most high God. And so now, follow the argument now, we don't have a choice in terms of where we're going and our identity. And so now, the only true control that we have as human beings, I hate to burst our bubbles, is to determine the quality of life that we're going to live, such as, are we going to claim our heritage or are we going to abandon our heritage? Those are the only Two choices we have on this narrow pathway that Jesus remind us about. So this quality of life includes how we were preordained by God to live or how we think we should live. For instance, do we know that it is God who preordained us to live an abundant life, the same life that Jesus referenced. Now I want to bring a truth forward. No matter what type of neglect that humanity suffers from, whether it's abuse, rejection, or abandonment like mine, it is from the environment, not from God. God is not to be blamed for what happens to us as a community because when God created us, he created us with the proactiveness for us to live communally, for us to talk to each other and depend on each other. And yes, we are each other's keeper. We are brothers and sisters. So everything that has happened, that is happening, or that will happen, has only to do with our earthly environment. God did not preordain any illnesses, sickness, neglect, negligence to any of his humanity. We must begin to take responsibility for what we are doing here on earth. Because God has preordained us to have an abundance of life, to come and enjoy our lives, it means that when you take a look inside of your preordained heritage portfolio, what you will see are all the blessings that were preordained long before 
We came forward. That is how good God is. We will see nothing more than the great promises of God, God's great intention for us, how intentional God is about us, how much he loves us. And this is what Jesus came to remind us about. So we have to now remember that it is God who preordained us to have this abundant life, who preordained us to live vicariously and to have all the riches that were meant for us to have this life and to get to know him before we even came out of the bird canal into the world's tunnel. We came from this rich God environment who preordained us, preordained us to be just like him. So if some of us have forgotten, then these types of conversations are to remind us how we are to re-navigate our lives, to move towards our destiny. We also want to be intentional to live the life according to how we were preordained to be and not according to how our environment shaped us to be. Now there's one goal I want us to keep in mind as we navigate through. God is not responsible for the things that we have done or for the things that others have done onto us. So whether we are the cause of the abuse or the abandonment, the rejection or the hurt, or whether we are the recipient of it, those are all environmental influences that we are responsible for because God gave us this world for us to have dominion, but also for us to care for it. And so one of the greatest things that we all know that God has given us free will, and it is the free will that we have that we must be accountable for. It sounds like free will, two little words, but those two little words have so much impact. They are assets. Have you ever seen where you can go to the store and you can buy everything because you're rich? You can buy anything. And so you can buy so many things that you become overclustered. You can be a hoarder. Some people hoard expensive cars. Some of us hoard expensive houses. But we hoard so many things because what? We can and we have the money. But we don't even know why. We hoard these things. There's a phobia why we do these things. And so the same way how we have free will, free will is impacted on anything that we want to do. We can get anything, do anything, be anything. So you imagine you bring all the groceries into your house. Well, chances are you can die young too from obesity, from greed, from gluttony. We can draw diseases onto us that is generational and because my mama did it my my first generation and my last generation my fourth generation going backwards did it now we are impacted by it because of the blood disease that have traveled through the hereditary or dna not god's dna with god's dna we were programmed we were preordained to take a look at our free will and exercise it as a gift but of course, our choice is we can also be abusive. We can abuse our gifts. And so free will is a very powerful, rich, loaded state of being. If we had to pay for everything that we were free to do, how poor we would be or how rich we would have to have been in order to afford all the choices that we made. If someone were to charge us, and do you know if human beings could, they would charge you for the very air that we breathe? But imagine if someone were to be able to charge us for every decision that we made. How rich would we have to have been? How rich would we have to be? So it's a very powerfully uh, compounded two little words. Free will. God gave it to us. And so because God gave it to us, we can afford to do everything, including forget about God, 
including disowning God? Does that make sense? How awesome of a God you have to be to be so secure that you can create a system that can serve you or dishonor you. That is what we call awesome. <laughs>